Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on Virginia Satir's Human Growth Model. Virginia Satir was perhaps one of the most beloved family therapists ever, and in this lecture I'm going to give you a, an introduction to her work, and this lecture does go with my uh, textbooks, Mastering Competencies in Family Therapy, as well as Theory and Treatment Planning in Family Therapy. Virginia Satir is one of the leading experiential family therapists uh, and or humanistic family therapists. And so I would like to just spend a quick moment introducing you a bit to the assumptions of humanistic experiential family therapy approaches. There are four approaches that fall broadly within the humanistic family therapies. And these include Satir's model, symbolic experiential therapy developed by Carl Whitaker, also emotionally focused couples therapy, uh, primarily developed by Sue Johnson, as well as internal, internal family systems developed by Dick Schwartz. Some of the common practices and assumptions across these humanistic approaches includes that all of these approaches target emotional transactions primarily. And so when you're thinking about working with the family system, they're looking at the emotional system and focusing on how the, the emotional elements of the system. There's also in all of these approaches a, very much an emphasis on the warmth and empathy on the part of the therapist, as well as with, they talk about the therapist's use of self, the therapist's presence, their way of being in the room. And obviously, um, these elements may be um, included in other forms of therapy, but they are particularly emphasized and important and, and particularly part of the change process in experiential family therapies. And then also one thing you will notice is that these approaches tend to have more of an individual and family focus when compared to other family approaches. And so they will emphasize the um, individual level uh, of functioning and setting goals at the individual level as well as at the family level. So now let's take a look at Virginia Satir's family therapy approach. And we're going to begin with the juice, one of her most important contributions to the field of psychotherapy as a whole. One of Satir's um, most impactful ideas was this idea of the communication stances. And this is a very, it's kind of a shorthand way of looking at how people, when they feel um, emotionally threatened in one way or another, what kind of a survival stance or communication stance do they take? And Satir um, believed that when we are children and our families growing up, whenever we felt unsafe, we revert to one of these stances. We learn these in our families of origin, and to a certain degree, a person's communication stance might actually relate to um, another person in the family, so it could be learned from them or it could be complementary to them. And so, and these are stances that a person uses when they feel threatened. And so the idea here is um, that there are basically um, five different st communication stances, with one of them being the kind of healthy, ideal, uh, approach, uh, stance, which is congruent. And then the other four are variations of this, kind of more the survival stances. So uh, theoretically, everyone's trying to get to congruent most of the time, but essentially all of us revert to uh, one or more of these stances when under pressure. So congruent means that you're able to acknowledge what you're thinking and feeling with the other person's thinking and feeling, as well as have your communication be appropriate for the context, whatever that might be, whether it's a professional relationship or an intimate relationship. Now, when we all, when we feel threatened, and typically as children, we develop uh, survival stances, ways to survive when we don't feel safe when we're young. And so one's potential stance is the placating stance. And this is, in this stance, the person in order to survive in the relationship, they ignore their own thoughts and feelings and focus on the thoughts and feelings of others. And uh, there's some variation in Satir's work at to what degree a placator acknowledges context and um, with her earlier work not having that acknowledged and later work adding that. And I, I think there really can be a variation um, to what degree a placator acknowledges the, the context also. And so placators are very quick to put aside their thoughts and needs and wishes in order to keep the peace. And so we will, you will find that there are a lot of placators who come to counseling and 
therapy for services because often they're so quick to deny their own thoughts and feelings. And so when you're working with someone who uses this stance, your job as the therapist is to help that person learn how to acknowledge their own thoughts and feelings as well as those of others and not just give up their own thoughts and feelings just because you know they're worried about having conflict because a placator would rather not have their way and have peace than have to uh, assert their needs and risk having um, tension in the relationship so and in fact I would say most people called to this profession tend to take the placating stance so and you will see a fair amount of this the kind of opposite of this is the blamer stance and the person who takes the blamer stance when they feel threatened what they will do is assert their needs and desires and minimize those of others. And so oftentimes you'll find a placator and a blamer married together because their two stances are complementary. Um, so blamers, when they're in therapy, they what your task as a therapist is to help this person learn how to acknowledge and develop empathy um, for the thoughts and needs of others. And so that's the task there. And in terms of the super reasonable, this is a person who, when they're uh, feeling threatened in one way or another, they revert to the context, some kind of logical external system um, in order, to, and what they do is actually deny that both the thoughts and the feelings of others. So often these people will revert to some sort of external system of logic. It could even be a, a type of religious system of black and white thinking, interpreting it in a very black and white way, or it can be a very legalistic or pure logical. Sometimes you can think of, um, you know, Dr. Spock on Star Trek kind of had a super reasonable approach to things. Um, and so this is someone who often just focuses on what, what is logical or what is allowed given whatever system um, of rules they uh, kind of apply to or ascribe to when under stress. And so they're often they're not particularly emotional um, in their presentation. And then finally we have the irrelevant type. And this is the person who, under stress, distracts. And so at a very benign level, or um, common level, is the class clown. So this is a person when tension and stress seems to rise in a relationship or in a room, they're going to distract with humor or something off the topic, but they're going to do something to just distract everyone from the tension in the room. At the most extreme form, um, this is seen in schizophrenics, because schizophrenia is a way of just being totally irrelevant, um, and, and to the extent that you're not kind of connecting with everyone else's reality. So the irrelevant type doesn't acknowledge self, other, or context. And so um, so for the irrelevant type, a lot of the task is to just get that person re-engaged with the difficult topic that they would prefer to just avoid in one way or another. And so what's interesting about these communication stances is that when you're working with clients, you can use them to help um, better understand how to intervene or how to communicate with your client. For example, when you're working with a placator, these are probably the most delightful clients to work with because they will never typically let their therapist know that they're unhappy with what's going on. And so they will often agree with whatever the therapist has to say because they like to agree with everybody. And so when working with a placator, for example, I'm very cautious in terms about if I, if I am going to make some suggestion or comment, I'd like to have multiple options, multiple perspectives, and, and ask them which one, you know, do you think is the best fit or might work for you? And, but it's always asking them to give voice to their thoughts and opinions because so, they'll be very quick to even try to please the therapist. And so for placators, their task is to learn how to assert themselves and in a healthy way, not, you don't want to turn them into a blamer, sometimes that can happen, um, but how to learn how to assert their needs so that they don't become um, resentful or often they can become depressed because they don't get their needs taken care of because they don't advocate for them. And so it's important when you look at a family too to look at how all these different roles um, are interacting within the family system. So in terms of working with um, the different survival stances, as I mentioned, uh, 
before that placators, they minimize the self, they're people pleasers, and so typically they do need less directive therapy methods to allow their voice to come to the uh, forefront. In terms of working with the blamer, since they minimize the other, the focus of the therapist is to really increase their awareness of others' thoughts and feelings, whether or not those others are in the room. And oftentimes, a blamer actually responds really well to direct, more direct confrontation and communications, and that actually can strengthen the therapeutic relationship. Because often a blamers, uh, who people who tend towards this, they find people who are um, tend more towards the placating side who are not direct, they will often see that as, as a weakness of sorts. And so sometimes with blamers, uh, therapists um, can actually strengthen the relationship by being more direct and upfront and oftentimes they'll say, you know, don't sugarcoat things for me. Just tell me the way I, you know, just tell me the truth. And so often those are people who like that type of direct confrontation. So when working with people who tend towards the super reasonable stance, um, it's important that therapists understand the logic and or rules that they use to organize their world. And so oftentimes therapists may need to re refer to this context in order to gain validity. It's very important to understand the logic of whatever system that they're applying to. And at the same time though, bringing in recognition of both their own personal, identifying their and you know, valuing their own personal desires and needs, even if they're not logical, and also acknowledging that the needs and desires of others are valid even if they're not perfectly logical or fitting with a particular moral code or you know whatever so learning how to teach them how to acknowledge all three areas of functioning and with the irrelevant type there really is an emphasis uh, because when as soon as things get tense their tendency is to um, to, to distract in some way and to have irrelevant you know whether it's humor or just a different topic, switch topics. So with the irrelevant type, the therapist really needs to focus on creating safety. Because if you have the, if, if someone who tends towards this type feels safe, they're much l less likely to distract. So the emphasis is really um, on safety and then helping them learn how to recognize and not be afraid of their own thoughts and feelings and those of others, and to help them learn how to stay present and engage with um, these various um, realities and areas of functioning. So now I want to uh, give you an overview of treatment in the Satir approach. So when Satir conceptualized family therapy, she conceptualized it in terms of a six-stage model. And in the beginning, you're engaging, and as a therapist, you're assessing what is the status quo? Well, how is the system fa and family functioning at this time? And then the therapist is going to be basically introducing a foreign element. And so that foreign element can be um, a new way of looking at the interactions and this foreign element of how to communicate in a more congruent way. And then the next phase of what happens is what she calls chaos. Because the family is having to deal with this new element, this new way of interacting this new idea or new belief, this, you know, you know, learning to tolerate direct emotional expression, whatever it might be. And so that's very, that, that disrupts the family homeostasis, for lack of a better word. And, and so there's this chaos is that people are beginning to integrate, you know, there's kind of a, a positive feedback loop and there's new information in the system and so there's chaos. And then eventually there's this integration of the new possibilities. So eventually then they integrate, with the therapist's help, this new element to the family system, and they practice this new skill, and they learn how to become comfortable with, you know, it could be direct communication, expressing emotions, whatever it might be. And then there is a new status quo, new family homeostasis. As you uh, may recall that Satir was a member um, at, of the, at the MRI Institute, and so she very much was at the foundation of using um, family, I mean, systems to understand families. And so you can see very clearly here this emphasis on homeostasis in her work as the foundation and kind of conceptualizing. And the family can go through several cycles of this. It's not like it's just one, you, get, you integrate one foreign element and you're done. It could be the case. But typically they, you would, the family would engage in this uh, kind of cycle of change more than once.
So now we're going to move on to talk about the therapeutic relationship in the Satir approach, and this really is a hallmark uh, in her approach. If you get a chance to see Virginia Satir in action, her presence is just unmistakable. It is unique. It is signature. It is so much um, is why she's so unforgettable, really, as a figure in the field. And a lot of her way of interacting with people comes from this, these very fundamental assumptions about human nature, which are um, humanistic in origin. And her humanistic beliefs just permeate the room. And this is very much part of the approach. And so when working from this approach, this this belief, these assumptions about human nature really um, are th at the heart of the relationship. And she really believed that all people naturally tend towards positive growth. And so very much like other humanists such as Carl Rogers, um, Virginia Satir really believed that people naturally tend towards uh, positive growth and that there can be obstacles in the way, but as we remove this, those, this natural tendency will occur. And so extremely optimistic. So all people possess the resources for positive growth is another assumption that people can grow, people can do this, people can change, and this is just palpable in the room. She also believes everything impacts and is impacted by everything else, and so this is a basic systemic view, and that you know everything is interrelated, everyone's affecting each other. And so, and then finally within, her fourth assumption is within the therapy process itself, um, is that therapy is actually an interaction between therapist and clients, a human relationship, and that each person is responsible for him or herself within this relationship. And so each person needs to take responsibility for how they're communicating and how they're relating, and that includes the therapist. So these are the basic assumptions that are just foundational to how the therapist engages the client at a very, very fundamental philosophical level. So Satir shares with many other humanistic therapists um, assumptions about how they engage the family therapy, family relationship, the therapeutic relationship. So first of all, there is a warmth and humanity that is unmistakable. The therapist is, is a fully engaged, warm human being who is very empathy. The empathy is very um, and for, first and foremost in that relationship, very much. Uh, in line with Carl Rogers. There's an incredible sense of conveying hope, and that comes from her assumptions. And she also talks about making contact. And she's talking about making emotional contact here. Um, and this is also language that you see in Gestalt therapy. But this is about making real contact with the person at an intimate level, contacting them in a very intimate, um, authentic, engaged way. And um, this is something that's really unmistakable to the parties in the room. And then finally, there is an emphasis on establishing credibility that, that uh, Satir really believed that the therapist, it's not just that you're warm and fuzzy, but it's you, there is a credibility. The clients, you need to instill that hope that in the clients that you can be helpful to them. So now let's talk a little bit about case conceptualization using Satir's ideas. So like other family therapists, uh, Satir believed that the symptom played a role in balancing the family's homeostasis. Particularly, there's an emotional role there. And so, and so what the therapist tries to do is understand how um, the, symptom, the symptoms within the family, even if they're at the individual level, um, function to keep the, the family balanced. And so an example could be a child's acting out can serve to reduce tension in the marriage by getting the parents to work together to uh, parent the child who's acting out. And so there's always this emphasis, just like any other uh, systemic family therapist, on what is the role of the symptom within the broader family system. Satir also considered other family dynamics, uh, such as looking at power struggles within the family, which could be between parents or between parents and children, or even between siblings sometimes, looking at parental conflicts and those patterns. And she also looked for um, lack of validation between members, as well as a lack of intimacy 
between uh, family members. So looking at uh, kind of in um, more contemporary terms, looking at, you know, attachment patterns within the family. Another way Satir looked at families was to consider the roles, kind of like the archetypal roles, although she wouldn't use, not thinking, um, not using uh, Jungian archetypes, but kind of the the roles of the uh, members of the family. So some of the more common roles are being a role of a martyr, the victim, the one who rescues the good child or good parent versus the bad child or bad parent. So she would look at these patterns um, within the family to help understand the system and how it worked and each person's role within it. Another assessment element or technique that Satir frequently used was uh, what she called taking a family life chronology. And this is a timeline actually that looked at the major events um, within a family's life. And so looking at the births and deaths, looking at events like marriages, moves, you know, various tragedies, major illnesses, job loss, those sorts of things, any type of even historical events such as a war or a natural disaster, even an economic downturn, you know, how all those pieces fit together. And this kind of is used to give both the therapist and the client insight into the broader context of a given problem, as well as some st any strengths and resources that might exist within the family. And so this um, is just a, basically a timeline that you can construct with your families uh, and clients to help understand the dynamics in a, in a broader sense. Also when working with families, the tears look at what you call the survival triad. And that is the child and its two parents. And so Satir really believed that this primary uh, triad is how a child learns to be human. She calls it sometimes either the primary triad or the survival triad. And so this triad needs to be a nurturing system for the child. And so when a child is experiencing difficulty, the, parent, uh, the therapist looks at how this triad is functioning. And so this is real central to how Satir would understand um, what's going on in a client's life and of course looking for a, a nurturing re relationship between the child and both of its parents. Satir used the iceberg uh, to describe the six levels of experiencing and this is more at an individual level here in terms of kind of how each individual is experiencing an interaction for example. And so the layers of the iceberg are this. And so you imagine an iceberg with what you can really see are the top elements and what's below it is um, the things that are lower down are below the surface so you may not see them on the outside. So the top layers here are behavior, so that's something you can definitely see. And, and then coping, how a person is coping with a stressful situation. And these lower ones increasingly are things that often um, are below the surface and you can't see. You know, what are the feelings that are um, related to that coping? What are the perceptions? How is the person perceiving um, what's going on in their life? What kind of meanings are they making? Then their expectations. What are the expectations that are fueling all of this? And then finally underneath, what are the very primal yearnings? Um, and so this iceberg is used to help clients explore um, both if something's problematic, you know, here's this prob you know, problematic behavior, you're yelling and screaming at your child, um, you don't want to even be doing that, so let's look at, you know, how are you coping, what are the feelings underneath that, maybe feeling helpless, angry, betrayed, you know, what are the perceptions that may underlie that, well, kids should be listening to their parents, they should always be respectful of their parents, um, and then you know, looking at the yearnings underneath that. I do want to have a loving relationship with my child. I want to feel like my child respects me or, you know, whatever it might be, feel like I'm a good parent. So you would go through these various layers to help clients understand. And, um, and then from that, you can look at how they can move forward to more, um, to, to better meet uh, their, those deep yearnings that may be fueling something that may even be problematic behavior on the um, outside at the top level of, at the tip of the iceberg. So another concept that's very central to Satir's work and probably one of the elements um, that is most well known is the concept of self-worth and self-esteem. She really made this part of her therapy approach and, and so she focuses on building the self-worth and sense of self-esteem 
within her client. In more recent years, there's also the inclusion of what they call self-compassion, which actually happens to be a better indicator of happiness than self-esteem. And so the th part of the therapy process and the assessment conceptualization process is looking at to what extent does the client value themselves and because it's often going to be very much um, a place if someone doesn't value themselves, if they don't have a, a strong sense of self-worth or self-esteem, they're likely to be struggling in their relationships and other areas of life. And so looking at this and trying to strengthen this as part of the therapeutic process. And so Satir also looked at the mind-body connection, and this is something we do see with um, a fair number of experiential therapists more than um, many other schools. And so Satir would also look at how emotional issues may be manifesting um, either symbolically or functionally within the person. Um, and so, and then also when doing the um, communication stances, we're going to talk about sculpting in just a couple minutes here, um, that these stances are actually associated with certain ways of holding one's body. And so congruent communication um, tends to be an open, relaxed body posture, placating, tends to be much more timid, more timid and reserved. Um, blaming stance tends to be much more, um, you know, angry, pointed, stiff. The super reasonable tends to be kind of an aloof, cold, and distant posture. And the irrelevant tends to be much more hyper, distracted. And so she also tracked the mind-body connection uh, when working with clients. So now let's look at goal setting using the Satir approach. So at its broadest level, Satir, like all the other humanists, have the basic overarching goal of personal transformation, kind of realizing one's full potential, self-actualization. So she has this goal that's very much out of the humanist tradition, which is distinct from many other family therapy approaches. Within that, though, there are two kind of practical goals that you're going to see in the treatment planning. One is relationally focused, and it's always the focus is on having commun congruent communication in all relationships. And then the more individual goal is the self-actualization of each member of the family if you're working with the system. So now we're going to move on to talk about interventions and the Satir approach. Capturing a Interventions in the Satir approach is not necessarily an easy thing. She has both some very broad general ways of intervening as well as some very specific, almost structured exercises, some that would be used more specifically and, and rarely, such as sculpting. Typically, you wouldn't be doing that every week, and others that are much more general. So let's jump into some of these. And first and foremost, as we talked about earlier too, is this therapist's use of self. The way the therapist is in the room, their presence is so much part of the intervention and transformation process for, for the clients. There, um, so along with that, um, in a more structured way, is this concept of the ingredients of interaction. And so whenever the uh, therapist is... Um, talking with clients about difficult situations and interactions with others, they ask a series of questions. And again, um, this kind of goes along with some of the elements of the iceberg. So what do I hear and see? Okay, What's happening at the behavioral level without any interpretation? Very behavioral description. You know, my, I asked the ch my child to take out you know, the trash and they did not do so. so. And then you move on to what are the meanings I make of this? And so here, again, you're moving kind of down the iceberg in a way. And so looking at, you know, how is the parent, what are the parents saying? My child doesn't respect me. My child's lazy. Whatever might be going on. Then what feelings do I have about these meanings that I'm making? And so I'm angry. I feel betrayed. I, um, I feel sad. I feel helpless. There are a range of feelings a person can have even about the similar situation. And then what feelings do I have about those feelings? And so what are my feelings, my secondary feelings? How do I feel about feeling helpless that my child won't take out the trash? Or how do I feel about being angry that my child won't take out the trash? So to have the parent even reflect, because even if you're having a feeling, you can often have a secondary feeling about that. I'm embarrassed, you know, or, um, you know, I'm embarrassed that I'm angry at my child about this, or, or I'm um, angry that I feel helpless. So, you know, you can have secondary feelings. And then what defenses do I use? So what am I doing 
how do I respond? How does this trigger me? And what kind of defense, um, defensive behaviors might I bring? You know, that makes me yell, or that makes me um, be cold and distant, um, or I may attack my partner because of this. You know, so to have the person look at what they're doing, and what are the rules for commenting? Do I use? And this comes really directly out of the communication research that you worked on at the MRI institution. So, what are the rules within the system about how to comment? Um, about what's going on, what is allowed, what is appropriate. And so this can vary wildly from one family to another. It often very much defines the system. And then what is my response in the situation? So what am I doing? And so at all these different levels, um, going through these and identifying these can often help people see what they're doing and you know make better decisions and or they can work with a the therapist to find alternative ways to respond better co and communicate in a more congruent way. And so this kind of li links into a lot of, um, when you see satire in action, a lot of what she's doing is facilitating congruent expression, emotional expression. So helping uh, family members communicate with each other in a congruent way without the placating, the blaming, the super reasonableness or the irrelevant stance. And so a lot of what she's doing is having people turn chairs to each other, talk directly, look in their eyes, hold hands, whatever it might be. So softening family rules is another type of intervention used in the approach. And in what this refers to is when families have very rigid rules about perhaps who can say what, when, where, and how, um, she will soften some of these to create more space for everyone's um, particular way of communicating in a comfortable way to hopefully reduce the use of survival stances. Um, communication enhancement, again, goes into helping each member of the family learn to communicate congruently even under stressful certain sense circumstances, even when they do feel threatened by their partner or their child, rather than reverting to a survival stance, um, to help them learn how to be fully congruent and present and, and to have more effective communications. There is a very signature technique within the satire approach, which is called sculpting, um, sometimes called spatial metaphor, but most often called sculpting, where she would take each person and um, sculpt them. And so she would position each person in the family to metaphorically represent their role. So um, a placator may be sculpted as kind of being on their knees and begging. The blamer may be there, you know, pointing their finger angrily at someone. You know, the irrelevant type might be in a strange position, kind of far off from everybody else. And, um, you know, the uh, super reasonable might be sitting there with a book, kind of just in a very kind of cold, distant, you know, I'm citing the book, the rules, the rule book. So in these, um, it may sound a little bit odd, but when you're part of the sculpting, it's, it can be a very emotional experience and it's very interesting because what what's it's because it's visual more than verbal you can add verbal um a verbal element to it by having each person um uh, say kind of like a, a motto of theirs you know oh you know oh please be nice to me or you know do what i say or whatever it is you know follow the rules whatever their basic motto is um that represents their position in the family um, but primarily it's very uh, visual and uh, it's a very emotionally intense experience and so it can often bypass a lot of other defenses when you, you know, have your child, you know, sculpt the family and realize um, where the child feels totally on the outs or totally disconnected or whatever, you know, often that can bypass a lot of other intellectual defenses because it is such an emotional experience. This can be done with actual family members sculpting themselves. Typically you would have each member sculpt how they see the family, how he or she sees the family, excuse me. Or it can be done in kind of a group therapy context where members of the group, play, you know, sculpt out roles within the individual's family. You have to do each person's family separately. Um, so those are different ways that sculpting can be used. And so it's a very, um, it can be a very, very powerful intervention uh, that's been, can be used in different types of therapy settings. And then finally, Satir is uh, well known for her use of touch. And she would touch clients and and she would you know, help clients learn how to hold and touch each other in nurturing ways. And you know, this was uh, back in a day where touching clients was probably less legally you know, micromanaged. Um, 
and it's but it is a hallmark of her approach and it is something I would say in today's practice you need to be you know very careful about how you approach that because we do have um, certain ethical and legal mandates around touching clients but I this clearly goes within her cult, uh, theoretical framework of creating nurturing family relationships and the emphasis really should be on helping clients learning how to nurture each other both emotionally and physically and I just want to spend a, a few moments here uh, talking about working with diverse populations Satir's uh, approach is used widely around the world, um, and so it certainly is can be used with a variety of cultural, ethnic um, groups, but it's very important when you're working with diverse clients to be very mindful of cultural norms and attitudes about emotional expression. And so humanistic approaches very much uh, favor very direct, warm, engaged communication and that's not true about all cultures so it's very important to um, consider the cultural norms for example in East Asia that type of warm direct communication is not is um, outside of the norm of typical um, communication that said uh, Satir's work and other humanistic approaches are very popular um, in East Asia, um, but it does need to be uh, adopted, especially in terms of how the therapist is assessing and evaluating the, the emotional expression within the family, definitely has to be considered within both gender and cultural norms. Um, similarly, this approach has been used quite widely um, in the LGBTQ community, um, and there is this um, because of the emphasis on self-worth and recognition and becoming one's authentic self it very much um, focuses on this and the sculpting and communication stances I think add a very rich element that can be used when working with highly marginal populations and so this has uh, been an approach that has been used but with a wide range of diverse clients it's just important when you're thinking about emotional expression that that is very much dictated by culture gender even social economic norms and so to keep this in mind um, and when you are working with clients and coaching them and helping to them to learn how to communicate um, more directly uh, with with those in intimate relationships and to make sure that that it's clearly appropriate for a given culture or gendered group and so in wrapping this uh, a lecture up. It's. I just want to highlight that what's really unique about S Virginia Satir's approach, besides her just amazing human presence that she she brings personally, but her approach is also very signature in that it addresses both systemic as well as individual ideas and um, works both at the individual and systemic levels. And so, this is unique, I think, among all therapies to have this nice balance, and and so. It is an approach that has a lot of applications in utility and can be used with a wide range of issues because of its multiple le levels at which it conceptualizes and intervenes. And for those who are interested in learning more about practicing from a Satir approach, I highly recommend you kind of connect up with the Satir's uh, global network, um, which has links across the globe. because. This is the primary place where you can learn to do this approach, and so I encourage you to research further if you're interested.